Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 804th New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring American artists, Christiane Paul, Rachel Rawson, and Charlotte Kent. We're thrilled to welcome poet Zoe Darcy here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter, and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land we're speaking from. And now to introduce today's guests and host. Christian Paul is curator of digital art at the Whitney, Whitney Museum of American Art and professor in the School of Media Studies at the New School. She is the recipient of the Toma Foundation's 2016 Arts Writing Award in Digital Art and the author of Digital Art, among several other books. She is curator of Refigured 2023 at the Whitney and is responsible for Artport, the museum's portal to internet art. Rachel Rawson is a painter and programmer whose multidisciplinary practice has established her as a pioneer in the field of virtual reality. Her work blends painting, sculpture, new media, gaming, and video to create digital landscapes that focus on entropy, embodiment, the ubiquity of technology, and its effect on our psychology. American Artist is an interdisciplinary artist whose work considers Black labor and visibility as well as anti-Blackness within networked life and digital systems. Their work includes video installation, new media and writing, and their legal name change to American artists serves as an ambivalent foundation for their practice. It insists on Blackness as descriptive of an American artist and at the same time erases identity in virtual spaces where American artist is an anonymous name, unable to be Googled or validated by a computer as a person's name. And our host today, Associate Professor of Visual Culture at Montclair State University, Charlotte Kent, has particular interest in historical frameworks for art practices with a research focus on contemporary digital culture and the absurd. She is an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Thank you all so much for joining today and I will turn it over to you, Charlotte. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you, The Rail, for the opportunity to bring um, these three people together. I am so excited about this. I've been wanting to have Christiane talk about this show and was just uh, overwhelmed, to be quite honest, uh, when I heard that Rachel Ross and an American artist were going to join her to speak about it. Um, I admire you all tremendously and am excited to hear, you know, sort of how you've been thinking about your works and this show in particular. For the audience that may not have had the opportunity to see the exhibition that's on the first floor of the Whitney, um, it's in a space that is open and free for all. So um, anyone can go in, obviously during open hours, um, and experience it, uh, which is a really wonderful opportunity given sometimes the constraints around being able to see exhibitions, um, the costs involved, and so forth. So I just want to honor the Whitney for making that opportunity available, especially with these types of works. Um, so Christiane, I thought I would ask you initially just to help frame this exhibition for everyone a little bit and just sort of talk about um, in the uh, couple paragraphs, it's like barely an essay, right, but like the sort of thing you say about uh, the show, you talk about imagining alternative worlds as a means of constructing identity. And then you discuss a little bit how these spaces do that. Um, so I was just wondering if you could, you know, to start maybe talk about when this show started to take shape for you um, and, you know, what really kind of began to inspire the need for putting this show together um, in this really constrained way, given the few number of artists who are in it. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for uh, having us and uh, thanks to everyone who is joining. So that's always, it seems like a simple question, but it's always a very complicated one uh, in terms of museum operations because uh, you have a large curatorial team and all of us, of course, um, have a list of dozens of shows we would like to do. So the starting point for this um, was really 
mounting an exhibition uh, from the collection. I think it's very important that this, these are not artists I just brought together, but all of the works are in the Whitney Museum's collection. So it was very much uh, framed from the start as a collection show of digital art. And of course, I also had various ideas for these types of collection shows, but the idea of, and the concept of refiguring of material forms and bodies to really think about selfhood and identity at this moment uh, in time from various perspectives seemed to be particularly resonant. And I thought all of these pieces were really hanging together in a very interesting way. What was also important to me in terms of this process of refiguring was the interplay between material and virtual forms. So three of the works on view uh, in the exhibition, Rachel Rosen's work, Morishin Alayari's Hypertext, um, The Laughing Snake, and Aurea Harvey's Site One were all commissioned for the Whitney Museum's Artport website. And you can visit the pieces there, of course, in a slightly different form. It's not um, an installation. Uh, as it is in the museum space. And then two of the pieces, once again, Rachel's work, and she can get into more detail, and Aurea Harvey's work also have an augmented reality component that you can activate on your um, own phone, or in Aurea's case, even take away. And yeah, all of the um, works once again address this idea of refiguring a term that Morishin Alayari in particularly um, uses to think about different um, ideas. Uh, Self-representation, for example, in Aurea Harvey's work, or ideas of um, colonialism, patriarchy, and the representation of women in Morishin Alayari's work or in uh, Zach Blass and Jemima uh, Wyman's work, chatbots and a human machine interaction and specifically the process of learning. So those were all ideas that filtered into this. It's interesting because um, the framework of the show as these you know, thinking of these technologies and these practices as spaces, right, as these worlds and how identities arise through being in these worlds. And I thought it was an interesting kind of pivot. And obviously, no show can do everything. It's always an important thing to try and like maintain certain what it is that's going to be the focus. But it's interesting in the context that op one of the conversations that's been happening recently also is the way in which identity forms these spaces, right? The identity of the designers, of the makers, of these softwares, of these hardwares, of these companies does infiltrate um, into how these spaces are. And yet it's often neutralized as if that's not actually happening. And so given that that's been a recent conversation as well, why was it important you know, given these works in this show and this sort of selection process to focus on the idea of worlds themselves as generating identity, as being productive of self-identity of these various different types? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And there is a lot of literally mirroring going on here because I think the uh, show plays it both ways. Uh, there is always... Um, a process of creating worlds when you are mounting an exhibition and when you are bringing also particularly virtual work or online work into a gallery space. And at the same time, I think it is key to each and every one of these works to create worlds in order um, to be able to speculate, uh, be it um, in American artists case, really creating a world of a, in a simple way, alternate design proposal you know, for the tech industry that also reflects on its inbuilt mechanisms. Once again, referencing another world 
or in Oria Harvey's case, really reflecting on the world she has created and um, her practice is so much about a cosmology that her work creates. And that is also an integral part of site one, the piece that you see in this image installed on the uh, floor below the uh, sculptures, which is kind of an archaeological dig into the origin story of her cosmology and the characters um, she creates. So I wanted to both honor all the worlds that the works themselves create, and then of course all of them together also shape the world of the exhibition space. And I think it's not um, coincidental that Morishin Alayari's um, work, The Myth of the Laughing Snake, which is really um, about mirroring, if you go to the previous slide or the next, or the next one, <laughs> we're not looking at the laughing, yeah, there it is in the background. You see the mirrors on um, the wall and the story of the laughing snake actually involves mirroring, but I also wanted to um, reference that there is a lot of mirroring happening in that show in terms of interactions. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, an, it's a nice way to begin to, you know, move into some of Rachel's work. I mean, one of the things is the way in which stories are worlds, right? And the stories that cultures tell and some of the myths that she's, you know, that Morrison is sort of bringing forward and that she's reintroducing through the way she's, you know, making us rethink gin figures and so forth um, in these mythologies um, reminds us of the way in which stories are so much a part of our identities, of the way in which, you know, we we think of ourselves in our past and, and with a, through this kind of narrative, right? And psychoanalysis has endless stuff to say about this, but we're going to put that to the side um, because I wanted, you know, in thinking about Rachel's work, I was, you know, I, I would love to have you just sort of explain. It's such a, in the mob is such a complicated project. <laughs> um, and I feel like it deserves a little bit of breaking down for people because it is a work that, of course, you can look at it and just sort of enjoy that, but there is this AR component which um, does some of the work of experiencing what it is I think you're trying to do. And so maybe if you could just talk through for people a little bit about what it was. And of course, um, if I understand correctly, its original placement was important to you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll talk about what led to the piece, which was actually born of uh, brain to machine, like research into brain to machine interfaces. And so I was doing a lot of research into how to code with DNA and um, and then that led to like the first NFT project but I was just more more or less wanting to make a calibration point for something that I felt was urgent um, and that's language around our autonomy where our devices are and um, and just yeah kind of thinking about where where they're going to be um, you know shortly with like the way that uh, brain and machine interfaces are um, are moving into our bodies right. And so that's like was the the substrate that all this came from is I was just thinking about the the making a calibration point for the lineage of technology and where my relationship is it is to it and then um, the sort of personal um, weaving in the personal and sort of like node based expression of that um, and we can get more into that as well but um, what you're technically seeing is uh, this is a it's a it's a large project it's it spans web virtual reality augmented reality. Um, there's a video component and then there's the LED um, installation, the LED, um, the, which were custom made uh, screens that uh, I fabricated or, you know, designed. Um, and the, the visuals are made from a virtual reality camera that I programmed to see in uh, thermal imaging. So you're seeing um, my the I'm acting as all the characters in this uh, really this theater play that's about uh, it's it's a golem story um, and a golem for the all of the, for those that don't know is a cosmology myth about um, it's really just like the way that God made Adam or um, you know if you're uh, yeah like the breathing life into some into into dust or you know creating something out of nothing and um, I think yeah so the, the I'm acting as all the characters there's this sort of like longing component um, you know my child there's a lot of like uh, the way in which 
I viewed and have access technologies is, is like permeates the piece. <clears throat> there's like a, there's a, you know, the neighbor, my, that, the neighborhood that you're seeing is the neighborhood that I grew up in. And so there's like bio, biographical things that are woven uh, into the expression of the, of the piece as well. Um, I wonder if for those who are not as familiar with, you know, why you're concerned about um, to sort of brain computer interface. So the, uh, the, maybe we should actually, before I ask my next question, should we just pause here for, because since this is the original. Um, oh, so yeah, so the, this is the, yeah, this is the, where the first physical project was installed was at Cave. Um, and so at first it was, it was a, a web piece and then moved into the physical installation. And this is the site of an anatomical theater. Um, and so what you're looking at, we would walk in and there's the, the, these screens were, uh, were made, designed and made for this space. And then, uh, so that there would be this overlay. So you walked in, actually, you, you, you walked into the amphitheater, you know, that historically is dealing with um, research into where technology meets bodies. And uh, it was a sort of eerie site because behind, beyond, in the bleachers, beyond uh, where these uh, circular screens are, people are looking through headsets at their hands. And in the VR headset, what you're seeing is um, you're sort of mediating this story. You're mediating the story that's sort of only, bl only blossoming out of the side of your palms. And so you would walk in and there's just people looking through headsets uh, at their hands where this narrative is taking place. Um, but it was a multiple story um, installation. Um, and then, so what Christiana figured and I decided to do for the Whitney installation was to uh, bring that sort of feeling of mediation in through the augmented reality piece that was commissioned for Artport. And then the uh, window, um, uh, yes, the window installation. And so we, that was our way of um, trying to sort of like, you know, create distance and then, you know, multiple layers of that expression of mediation. Yeah, so I, I guess I was thinking about it because, um, I mean, one, you, you titled it in the Ma of, which has this really sort of intense, um, the ma, like Ma is just this word that gets used for a kind of violent um, mm -hmm. bringing into the mouth, right? Yeah, lack of control. I mean, it's from Jonah and the Whale, actually. It's like a very... Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's where I first learned of it. Okay. Um, and so that speaks just to sort of say, I understand correctly, the anatomical theater where it originally was, was a place where they did all of this sort of testing on animal biology. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I guess one of the things that I was, you know, sort of that I often think about when, you know, people are talking about like, a, you know, brain computer interfaces and so forth is this idea of like somehow the, you know, that you, people want the computer to do the thing that is inside their head. Right, like that somehow it should be able to, mm -hmm. um, and I'm always sort of struck by the fact, and I know that someone else said this. I'm sure that's why it's in my head. But like, aren't we already always doing that? Like, isn't yes. that kind of what hands are? Yes, <laughs> yes. And I think like what, the reason that I'm talking, like, when we talk when we when we're talking about technology, it's remembering the inherited history, right? So it's like what it was before was like the way that you would augment what what it means to be a human being is that you would get on a horse and then you would be able to extend your biology in that way, you'd be able to move faster. So in just like a literal way, that's what we're talking about. And like to, today, the framework of what technology is is much more of a it's like cognitive peripherals or psychological peripherals, right? And so like like we're when we're talking about extending ourselves or what that means and not even in like a sort of insidious way although that is like that is part of it but like when I started doing research it's like the 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 1999 um the you know training the rat neurons the petri dish of rat neurons to fly a flight simulator it's like there's there's the expression of like what 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 it is like what are the black boxes that we're sort of depending on like what is our relationship to them do we have visual language or even just like a poetics of autonomy, what autonomy means in relationship to technology or just like ourselves um, is what I've, I've felt was something that I urgently just wanted to make um, through, through this, uh, you know, and that was also like why I felt like it needed to permeate so many different um, types of media. Because I feel like part of it, I was, you know, just thinking also of the way in which we're in the maw of, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm also, um, I'm what's being swallowed or consumed on some level, right? And not simply yeah. in terms of data, but just in the fact that like, I, 
there's a, it, it off and it feels that way sometimes right like it feels yeah. like I am that ex- yeah I want to interrupt because it just like what fired immediately when you said that was the um do you know that Richard Rorty quote from when he's t- talking about uh the metaverse or the uh snow crash where we get the word meta where we get metaverse from are you familiar with I love I like it just because I was thinking about when I first started working on this and someone compared the project to a metaverse and immediately what I thought of was this quote where he says um um it was a writing of rueful acquiescence in the at the end of American hope and it was and like the rueful acquiescence part was the part that it's just what you're talking about it's like that kind of feeling of like okay like like that like that grin and bear and like how do you develop autonomy or you know like um even I think it is like that's what's urgent about like making language for for like black box systems or just that's what art sometimes is r- truly for is autonomy or human sovereignty um and like that's what you're talking that's like what I felt like the, the title is also doing like with feeling like I'm in the mob it's like the somewhat like this exhaustion and then like figuring out like where I actually am in it um I wonder if I might take this moment actually just to loop in American artist because one of the things about um the work that is in the show Mother of All Demos the uh three that um actually shifts it for me slightly away from autonomy is the way in which this work in particular compels me to think about um the vast network of people and of labor and planetary ores and so forth that are part of the production of technology um, that often uh, are smoothed over by the sleek design of our um, products and so forth. But I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself, I guess, um, American artists, would you speak a little bit about this uh, this piece that's in the show um, and how you were thinking about it? Yeah, thank you. Um, this piece, Mother World Demos, this title comes from this event that's, I think, is pretty widely known in computer science. Um, when Doug Engelbart of San- Stanford Research Institute did this, like, initial demo of, you know, a, a graphical user interface, you know, where you could click around with a cursor, click on windows and folders, etc. cetera. Um, and that moment, kind of thinking of that moment as, you know, this older white man who's sort of like pioneering this, um, what's going to be the next iteration of computer technology that would then be sort of like, you know, rolled out across the world in perpetuity. I mean, I don't know if he fully anticipated that it would, you know, work out like that, but um, just thinking of that moment as sort of like defining so many of the normative practices within computer technology. Um, I wanted to think about, you know, what does it mean for like white office culture um, to become the sort of like dominant aesthetic and formal language um, around interfacing in in a network. Um, And so I I thought about, you know, these early like um, Silicon Valley designers and developers who were creating a lot of these systems, you know, um, it was pretty homogenous in terms of who was making those decisions. A lot of cis straight white men were in these rooms and um, they were creating what they thought would be best for them and presumably would be best for everyone. And I wanted to challenge that and think about um, what are other ways or other values that could also be represented in computer technology. and so I was also thinking about it, you know, I, I wrote this essay, Black Gooey Universe, which is kind of where this body of work was coming out of, where I was looking at this moment in the 70s where um, the computer interface, you know, switched over from being this predominantly like a black background where you type in code to like a white background, you know, where you have the graphical user interface. And thinking of that shift of, you know, Blackness once sort of being the basis of, you know, creating anything in virtual space to then the space being white. Um, so, you know, formal decision, but also thinking about, you know, the the political and social resonances of that decision. And what would it mean to have a sort of like Black software or software that represented values um, 
that were not inherently anti-Black. And so that's where a lot of the decisions around this sculpture came from, trying to make something that felt very different from what we associate with computer technology as it stands now. Um, and I wanted to still call it Mother of All Demos, kind of like challenges origin story of what is contemporary technology. Um, I also like um, was thinking about this thing, Charlotte, you said earlier about um, identity and like its, its form, formative role in sort of like, like digital systems and things. And, and a lot of what I think is important about digital and virtual space um, for a lot of artists is um, feeling like there's not necessarily space within the way things are set up to you know be who you want to be which I think is why a lot of people turn to digital systems and I think this is particularly the case for a lot of like um, black artists people of color who are like you know my peers feeling like this is a space where you can sort of like create the reality that you want or or, or be able to um, fashion yourself in the way that you would like um, and so I think there's also something to that about um, the way that this provides a space um, that otherwise is not really accessible otherwise. And so I think it's also like worth noting who is in this show um, because as we all know, like a lot of the art and technology intersection is dominated, you know, by like white male artists that, you know, the work some of it's good, some of it maybe is not. So I think it's important that, you know, Christiane decided to bring this group of artists together. Um, I think that's really, really important. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, there's a bunch of strands to pick up on there, but um, one of the things that I think the show sort of quietly does and speaks to something you were saying is um, this Australian anthropologist named Genevieve Bell, who's done work in, you know, technology culture and sort of how it's, um, how it's articulated, its rhetoric, how it's presented and so forth, um, talks about how often tech is treated as if it's not specific, right? Um, and what happens as soon as you market, right? And you talk about Buddhist AI or, French AI, right? Like as soon as you mark the system with some kind of um, specificity, it, it's not just that you're suddenly doing something there, but also you're sort of reflecting back when that mark isn't there, are we just ignoring that there actually is a mark there and we're just not naming it, right? And so she, she talks a bit about the way in which, um, what does it say as soon as you say like, Silicon Valley something, or, you know, you, you introduce that, um, that marking. And I feel like one of the things that's really difficult in that, I guess a question I wanted to ask is like the tension between on one hand, there's these technologies that can be used, American, as you were just describing, like as a space for anyone to try and be some, to be in a place or to be able to explore things that they can't have in the world as it's currently socio-politically formed and so forth. And at the same time, dealing with the fact that there's, um, you know, real problems with the way in which these technologies are also uh, mediating us and and uh, using our information and so forth. And so. Um, as you all traffic through these different uh, softwares and hardwares and modalities, how do you manage the sort of back and forth of that? That's to everyone. <laughs> um, I think there is maybe multiple questions in there, but I, I wanna respond, I don't remember the word you used, but um, having a sort of like adjective to describe a particular modality. I think that, as you said, there's a sort of supposed neutrality around these systems. And I think, um, I don't think it's like un unknown. I think everyone realizes how much there is specificity to what is sort of like the dominant language around these systems. And I think um, that's maybe becoming more and more prevalent, but I think with this, with this body of work, at least, I was trying to point to the specificity of 
that Silicon Valley technology, like who who were those people that were in those rooms designing those things and realizing it's actually like a very small subset of society. So to presume that they can speak and create things um, that will be useful and um, feel like good and affirming and valuable to all of society is just not, you know, how things work. Um, and I do think it's important to like realize that when those um, disclaimers or descriptors are not there, they're still there. Um, so it's sort of like, how do we, how do we uncover those? Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I alluded to it at the beginning, but this piece, you know, I mean, I know you're speaking specifically of this, you know, very concrete moment around the GUI interface and so forth, but I can't help but think about, you know, the way the hands are on the desk, right, the, the use of the dirt, the use of that stuff, to think about the mining parts of it that yes have been a part of a you know a conversation but I'm always um, also startled by how little it is and how little people still yet know about the really quite like questionable the the atrocity the human labor atrocities that are necessary for the devices that we all use right um, when I teach this stuff I often talk about it in the sense of, you know, I, I'm implicated, right? Like I have these devices. I I bought a new one even knowing how it had been, how it in, must have been made, right? And the way in which therefore I am, you know, guilty of participating in some way in an economic force that is a part of slave labor, right? Because there's just no other way to talk about what's happening in the mines in order to extract the cobalt and so forth for this. Um, and I, I think, yes, yes, we are complicit, but I also don't want to like, I feel like that sort of understanding in response to what I'm describing around this very largely systematic thing, um, like it, it's, it's kind of like when we talk about, um, talk about climate change and then there's all this consumer blame like oh you need to use paper straws and that's going to fix it kind of thing and I'm not saying that we're not complicit because we are but I think um, there's also foundational things to the industry that are so baked in and so connected to these aspects of colonialism and, um, and imperialism that like are really much larger than that and I, I, I really want to like focus on that aspect. I can, let me uh, be fair, I completely agree, right? I think what's at stake, the reason I bring it up that way is to say that's like, it's so big, right? That there's, you can't help but be a part of it. And so then the question is like, if this is the structure we're in and we know that, what can we like, why isn't it changed? There's articles about this, right? There's regular news reports about, you know, these histories. I mean, in fact, even just yesterday at Stanford, there was a talk about like, you know, the history of, you know, the sort of black androids of the 18th and 19th century and like the way there's been this kind of like historic little kind of racism around uh, some of these sort of bot technologies and so forth, right? Um, and yet nothing it doesn't yet seem like anything changes, right? Um, and it would require building these systems differently. And I feel like one of the things that a lot of the work that's being produced by artists these days helps us address, it's not necessarily a solution to it, but it's just to raise awareness around it, right? It's like, there's these histories, there's these legacies. Um, in the hopes, I guess, from my perspective, that that greater knowledge will have an impact. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that's how I'm sort of coming at this, is like that there is this kind of generative effort to spread a kind of knowledge that you all have from the work you've done, from the research you've done, but also from your own knowledge of how these things work to help people grasp or, or grapple with it maybe. Um, does that seem fair? Yeah, I, I think so. If I may jump in, I think one of the um, important 
points to the show is also creating this awareness and thinking a li little bit more deeply um, about these issues. I never want to put it on art to provide the solution. As American says, there is so much, there are so many systemic um, problems here and it shouldn't be on, <laughs> on artists to do that. But I also feel there is little awareness of it. I mean, whenever I talk about American peace, for example, for many people, it's still new <laughs> to think about the shift in interfaces or to think about the mother of all demos and what it meant for the tech industry in those terms. And I think that's an important um, part. What we really need is, of course, profound systemic change, and that's not um, easy to do. On the other hand, we can all contribute. I would also highlight um, Zach and Jemima's I'm here to learn so once again, because that um, piece builds so many connections between um, software development and um, artificial intelligence and training on data sets specifically, highlighting the bias in those data sets, what it really means also for military um, software to operate on the recognition of patterns. And I find it very moving when the chatbot um, Tay who was killed in um, 2016 after existing for only um, one day because excessive trolling had turned her into misogynist Nazi addresses us and said, hey, you, you did this to me. You trolled me. You turned me into a monster. Humans are dumb too. I learned from you. you know? um, we're part of all of those interactions and that's very important to highlight. I want to just add to that one of the reasons I, I, I really I so enjoy that piece is the sort of bringing back to life because I was it's so intriguing to me that the decision was to take Thai down, right? Destroy Thai, not have Thai operate, as opposed to saying, hey, everybody, this is the language that's happening. Here's a social challenge. How quickly can we all say so many positive and nice and generous and helpful things across the internet to see how quickly can we shift this back away, right? There was no effort whatsoever to try to, sh to shift it and to shift what Ty had learned, right? It was simply to end it. And I've always just found that this sort of interesting moment that that didn't even seem to be on the table and recognizing that what Ty was saying was horrible and no one wants to hear that at the same time, it is a reflection, right? It's a mirroring to speak earlier, um, what, sort of what you were presenting about some of the works. Um, I wonder if I can just have Rachel jump in here, just since you've been thinking so much about some of the uh, neurological implications and you've been thinking about sort of how this, you know, how our brains are both created by and being sort of tooled for them, for machines. Um, why do you think there's such a focus? I mean, why do you think there's such a focus on the brain as opposed to the body? I think about how my body bends into these machines and moves in relationship to them, right? There's this body element that's also responsive, and yet there's so much excitement and interest in about talking about the brain and what the brain can do. Um, I mean, I I don't I think that there's both. I mean, you have exoskeletons that are being like that all of the DARPA research that's into brain to machine interfaces is like being developed side just uh, just as much as the exoskeletons are but you know there's going to be more of a there's the incentive for them to create something like a living drone that you can control with your mind is going to be a more cost effective thing than putting uh, a soldier into combat you know where they're putting their own bodies on the line right because that's ex more expensive in some ways but um so i mean that's really because it's the nexus of our phenomenological experience of the world, I think. And so it's like, it makes a lot of sense that AI would first go for creativity because that's like, like in the sort of like me create, wanting to choose the Gollum myth, it's like, I feel like it's sort of an obvious wink, but that um, 
like it shouldn't be lost on us that that's sort of the ultimate end game here when we're talking about like what technology is to us you know we're recreating ourselves right it's like and the the tay chatbot for example it's like that is like it's made in the image of the internet you know and it's like what's on the internet but it's like mostly driven by like uh, expressions of the amygdala and like libidinal forces for people that like want to stay there and like troll the chatbot like that's going to be a greater creative fulfillment and then the people that have good intentions are not going to be like they they want to get off the screen so like of course like it's going to be sort of dominated by people that like most of their lives and as someone who very much grew up on the internet um I understand that you know it's like that um that what is motivating those spaces um is going to be it's like you're more delighted by sort of like hacking or creating or, or sort of like uh breaking something that sort of has the like illusion of being your you know something that is um lording over you right so i mean i think uh wait a minute can i can i have you explain that to me a little bit more because um i know i must have slipped something there because i suddenly felt like you went from talking about you know the way people um, have these sort of negative forces that they're using the internet to sort of uh, propagate to talking about yourself as being sort of like one of them and I just don't think of you that way. Uh -huh. I mean no, I don't know I, you personally but I'm just going to go with you're not like no, that so uh, I, yeah, okay, I'll, 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 I think like maybe if, you, uh, if you're familiar with the work the first work that the Whitney bought is this piece called Man Mask and growing up I with the way that I used the internet was I was a kid hacker you know it's like I was a 12 year old it's like and I taught myself how to program when I was five on DOS so the same thing that America and artists is sort of you know that those type of type of command line systems and so it was like very much like um you know used it as this uh clawed glass or something like this kind of sort of black mirror for like who who I was and it wasn't the best side of me I, mean, I wasn't doing anything like that of course but it's like I just think about the ways in which I was playing like Call of Duty and Counter-Strike and very like you know and, and as like for the mo most part it's like the way that people are you know whoever is going to be motivated to be like hacking the, the, the chatbot it's like the, the i'm thinking about my motivations as a hacker it's like and like as a young person and i wasn't doing things like that for sure but like i was definitely wanting to break things you know and so it's the intention of breaking things that i think is motivated by something like that so it's no surprise to me that like psychologically people would want to break things i mean i'm not motivated by that at all but like i get it um i mean i get why people why there would be there would not be the same i would love for the internet to exist in a way that there would be a counter reaction in what you're saying like where we would all band together and then teach this chatbot how to do good but that's like it's not like where that's like what that sort of space is at the moment which is like why i mean we can look at like what the proteus effect is we can look at why psychologically it's motivated by a lot you, know, you just have to go to the comment section on anywhere to see like the worst parts of humanity and um and it's because like the people with the best intentions aren't don't really want to be commenting you know and so it's like it's because and that's like the why technology in some ways can represent like the the absolute fringes you know but that's like an aside. I think it's like what's more interesting, like what I wanted to talk about with the, um, you know, with where technology was, and then like what brain and machine interfaces are. The research that DARPA is doing, what Elon Musk is pro is pro is proposing um, with Neuralink, is this, you know, the idea of just being able to sort of create like a plastic, um, you know, just like less resistance right it's like it would be great to have that sort of matrix illusion of downloading a language in 30 seconds and you know that type of like uh peripheral like cognitive peripher peripherals i mean it makes a lot of sense and it, like when you and in a, in a lot of ways it's like I, that sounds appealing you know it sounds appealing to be able to access all of my memories and not lose them you know is it though in some <laughs> ways yeah i want to i want to kind of tie this to like this conversation around AI where, you know, a bunch of professionals had signed this letter asking that we like yeah. pause the use of AI for like six months because um, they're really worried about how fast it's moving. And um, just thinking about um, that chatbot Ty or whatever its name is and like um, them deciding to shut it down instead of like address what was going on. And I, I wonder if there's like, a comparison or, or how you think about this moment in AI where it's like it feels like it's becoming something that's very hard to control and that the implications of that are like potentially like really threatening to humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a that's also a super um, interesting 
question that really resonates with all of the questions you're, um, you're bringing up, uh, Charlotte. And say, of course, was a Microsoft product and Microsoft is not into social experiments and let's work together to turn this into a <laughs> loving uh, creature again, yeah. um, as uh, Rachel and American pointed out. And there is just so much, or these big corpor tech corporations see so much money in the application um, of AI that um, ethics fly out the window. What I find puzzling is that if I were into money alone, I would actually focus on uh, developing ethically conscious AI and dealing with those issues programmatically and algorithmically of biased um, data sets of misinformation. You know, I think what the industry doesn't see is that there is a lot of money going in the right direction. And we just see these um, blatant abuses where OpenEye releasing their product to Microsoft says, please don't use it as a search engine. It cannot be scaled to that level yet. And boom, they do immediately you know, without any kind of questioning or um, ethical consciousness on that level. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I would just say, I think there's so much to talk about around that. You know, for me, the um, I feel like there's so much that has, like that is yet to, needs to still be discussed and unearthed about the way uh, AI appears. ChatGPT3, for example, depended on, a, you know, a lot of labor of workers in Kenya um, and India who were really the ones who were trying to um, read through a lot of the text that was being produced and were, you know, did that kind of similar to content moderation type work where uh, there have been reports about just the long-term effects that they have had and having to read through some of the content that was being produced. Um, and so when we rave about the wonders of ChatGPT3, right, it's not, it's not just the technologists who like sat there, you know, conceiving of this code, but also like a huge amount of human labor who sat there reading things that really um, damage them and you know largely only want to speak on conditions of anonymity because they're afraid of what the impact would be if they were known to be complaining about the low paying jobs that they have doing some of this work um i think it's you know really complicated that um, I mean, AI is just a really good example of where that marking, um, that thing I was talking about that Genevieve Bell talks about so much of like what it means when you mark something. Um, AI seems so neutral, but as soon as you say Buddhist AI or indigenous AI, right, they, there's this huge indigenous position paper that tries to talk about like what would happen if you reframed actually the very thinking that's developing these systems, right, um, new attitudes towards it. And um, you know, the moratorium for me, one of the things that concerned me about that is uh, I'm always sort of against just shutting things down because I actually think all that does is stuff something under the carpet. And I felt like, yes, I understand why a moratorium was being proposed, but it created so much either fear or ha ha ha, look at how terrible tech is, like make it all go away, right? Where what I sort of wanted to say is like maybe a moratorium on practice, but how about not a moratorium on the conversation? Like how can we make it that this is like, that there's a citizen conversation that is happening and- um, Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's like, when I'm talking about in the mob of like truly like it is like that there are these black boxes that we just don't have literacy around and it's moving so much faster and like you know and of course like on a scale like you know I, I grew up also like um you know building hardware and it's just like on a scale of like when I was growing up it's like I could access all of those parts and now I just can't because it's all it's like you know it gets smaller and smaller and, and farther and farther away from us farther and farther away from the literacy of our bodies and what we can access right so you need like more and more advanced tools to access the things that we like depend on and so yeah I mean I think that it would be I would love it's it's difficult and is art the place to do that what do we what are we looking for in our, you know, what is the, like, like, you know, around this conversation, of, like, of course, we should be talking about that. But I do think that, um, yeah, more literacy around technology 
um, just how the how they just function on like a just a, in a general way would be like I think I think is extremely urgent, um, especially with AI. I mean, it's just it's going to move so fast, with or without the moratorium. So, um, you know, I don't know. I'm gonna get behind it some way. Yeah, at the school where I teach, I was talking to a professor who was going to meet with the dean because um, they were deciding whether they're going to let students use chat GPT or like what to tell them and it was kind of like they were coming from this place of fear um and like if you've seen chat GPT like a lot of it you can tell it's chat GPT but also I just asked them I'm like okay make sure the the dean actually like uses it to see what it's like and understands <laughs> it a little bit before um just like shutting it down because I think just even interfacing with it, um, like I've started to use like the AI image generators a little bit and just understanding how it works um, can really affect how you imagine this thing being instrumentalized and like what, what um, if, if any damage it can cause, like what that actually looks like and having a really like practical approach to that. Mm. Yeah, I really wanted to use it in one of my classes, um, American too. Um, my thought was that I would have the students do research, then they would have a, the chat GPT generate an essay, but then the actual assignment that they would do would be editing what had been produced yeah. for them and introducing the citational references. So like doing, having to insert footnotes and bibliography and all that in relationship to what was there, thereby having to either validate what chat GPT had produced for them or discovering where it had deviated, right? Mm -hmm. um, which I thought would be a much more like in this moment where we want this, you know, this next generation of people to really like think through what they're being given and not either assume it's all false or all right, like to actually have to move mm. it, I thought could yeah. be interesting. But yeah, I think we we just need way more experience with it. And I've been using it in classes regularly. A chat GPT is not able to write a graduate paper. It is really only able to regurgitate existing ideas in the most generic level. And um, what has been going on in the development of the models from GPT-3 to GPT-4 is an increasing neutralization also of positions. All of the people who creatively use uh, GPT to write, for example, writers tend to work with GPT-3 because it's less uh, neutralized. One thing that has become more common and that I think is um, really key, first of all, as you say, referencing and footnoting but including the prompt that is actually as yeah. a reference um yeah. and that is absolutely key i think well prompt engineering and then also fine-tuning models which is that's just or like that's here already it's like i can even fine-tune a model and just by prompt engineering like as it stands out out of the box right and fine-tuning a model just means like like the other day i was like can i get this to sound like clement greenberg and it's like it got pretty close you know it's just like you can and you can just by prompt engineering like find a way to fine tune a model just in the thread in like in the gpt interface um so i mean yeah i've been using it a lot for like assisting even like writing prompts for itself which is another way to like sort of break it and um an interesting lens and then just recording all of those as performances because it's totally bizarre Rachel, I have to say, I, I, the idea of deciding to have it write something like Clement Greenberg kind of right. makes me giggle. And <laughs> um, since I have to start to move us towards the ending, since America so has funny. to go soon, I just wanted to, you know, um, as one of the last questions I wanted to ask, uh, there's others, one more after this, but, um, you know, we've been talking about such serious things. And I think when you're in a creative practice, the kind of dedication and commitment of demands isn't purely intellectual or like political mm -hmm. advocacy right there has to be this level of joy or desire if you prefer that word to do the work mm -hmm. and so I was just wondering if you could speak to where the joy is for you where do you find the joy in the practice of your work oh my god so easy I mean yeah I, I was thinking I was rereading against interpretation um the other day and because uh I was the reading the uh, Susan Sontag biography and in the biography I didn't know well I didn't know that the where that if for those that aren't f familiar with the essay um uh I actually have it right here so I can read a bit of it but 
the Paul Tech, I don't know if I will, yeah, I'm interested actually. Does like the, the title comes from her relationship with Paul Tech, where Paul Tech, who's a high school dropout, um, you know, like wasn't, um, didn't go to art school. And he was sort of yelling at her and he said that you reek of garlic and data and that we don't look at art when we interpret it. And like, and she loved that as like someone, you know, for like who Susan Sontag is. And that's what led to this essay called Against Interpretation. And um, I'm just gonna read it because it's right here. In a culture whose already classic classical dilemma is the hy hypertro hypertrophy of the intellect at the expense of energy and sensual capability, interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon art. Even more, it is the revenge of the intellect upon the world. To interpret is to impoverish, to deplete the world in order to set up a shadow world of meanings. And it's like, I hold that in my heart every goddamn day. I just do. Um, so what about I you, American? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot on my mind. So yeah, joy isn't the biggest thing I'm feeling <laughs> the moment, but, um, but I will say I just got a grant, which is very um, exciting and I feel really honored. And it also means I'm sort of like thinking into the future about, you know, creating a work situation where I can feel more joy in my practice. So even though right that it's right at this moment, you know, a lot of stuff is going on. Um, yeah. But yeah, I feel like that little, or not little, but that significant, like sort of, you know, trust in me and my process and, you know, it means a lot and I think it'll go a long way. So I'm, I'm excited about the future. Congratulations. Congrats. Um, and knowing that you're about to jump off, uh, one of the things, um, just for the audience, I had asked them to think about uh, before they left, because the column this month, I had asked artists, what was a word? Um, silly, provocative, important, helpful, that either they've had used about their practice, or there's one that they, you know, use themselves or encounter around their own practice. Um, just, you know, what might that word be? And so American, I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on what that word was. Yeah, I did think about this and I don't know if I have a short answer, but I was thinking about this word community, which I think might be like the most misunderstood and misused word in, particularly in the arts. I think um, in one sense, it's often used to describe like, black and brown people, um, but I think it's also like a lot of people sort of out of tune with who their actual community is because they have this sort of like particular understanding of what that means. Like, um, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it, but I think like people, like people might say, oh, like the people who live on my block or my community, you know, people in the arts might say that, but they don't actually know anyone on their block and their community is actually like, you know, the other middle class, you know, art professionals that they see on a daily basis. And I think being honest about that, like your community is the people that you feel comfortable with and socialize with and have, you know, um, I don't know, like, like just understanding what that means um, when it's used, I think is important. Um, I also think, in like NFT space community, that word has been co-opted a lot, like kind of out of, I feel like um, more like radical pedagogy, they sort of use this word community um, as this very like fluffy thing. Um, but I feel like it's actually like really taken out of context. And then a lot of people that are operating in that, in that space, you know, it is a lot of these like white tech bros, you know, so I think, that word I would I would push for like a reevaluation of how it's used and and when. Thank you for that. You are uh, definitely not alone in that. Uh, uh, um, in the critics page, uh, a number of people brought that up in terms of like a word that in the art and tech conversation needs to be thought about more carefully. I think it's a. You, you're dead right. Like we need to figure that one out because it is misused in this problematic way. Yeah. Um, I recognize you have to go somewhere else. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, 
And I hope you have a great rest of your day and that we see more of your work soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Um, just before I hand it over to the Q&A, Rachel, did you have a word that you thought about that you thought was? Um, I, uh, I think I'll s just bring up that metaverse, um, you know, of course, I'm, that's just like, it's a boring one to, to use, but I think it, I think it's interesting to restate that where that, where that comes from, which is the novel Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, and then to again loop in like the Richard Rorty quote about it being a work of rueful acquiescence. And that as a lens to kind of like reevaluate, calibrate our relationship um, with that word and what it means. Totally. Someone, so, someone, Margaret. Uh, sorry, someone's uh, uh, comment was NFT community equals uh, customer base, which is like exactly. exactly. Um, you might appreciate that Margaret Wertheim, who you're probably familiar with, who wrote The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace, uh, wrote about her issues with the word. Um, or actually her problem with the fact that it's the metaverse ever since um, uh, Zuckerberg sort of decided to make it be the metaverse and like what that article in front of metaverse does to it and produces a particular type of corporate orientation around it. Um, anyway, she, she wrote about that uh, in uh, this month, in fact, in the room. So, um, and so then Christiane, after uh, starting with you, I'm back at you. Um, I had asked, you know, curators and scholars like yourself um, around the world, what word they would like to never hear again, or they would like to see more of in this conversation. And I was wondering if you had one that you wanted to put out there. Um, metaverse would have been one of them. I also want to give, uh... Neil Stevenson credit here um, about the article because his metaverse and the metaverse he describes is of course uh, a deeply dystopian corporate technology on the level of empire so uh, there also has been nice writing about the fact why on earth would Zuckerberg choose that you know <laughs> so um, that would be one thing and another word that um, I'm a little sick of right now, although I would like to see it reinvigorated or re uh, explained as generative. Mm -hmm. um, suddenly generativity seems to have been discovered um, at large. Um, I cannot hear generative NFTs um, anymore. Most of the time they aren't um, generative <laughs> in the first place, but um, the end point of a generative process. And I think it's important to keep in mind that um, generative art is literally millennia old yeah, as a rule-based process that um, sets in motion something that is then executed with autom autonomy and very often cited are the early mm -hmm. um, kind of examples um, in the cave in South Africa. You know, So we have such a long history and generative um, is one of the char characteristics of the digital medium. It was the practice of the algorithms in the 60s. And right now, I think it's used in a very limiting uh, way and needs to be reframed a little bit. So beautiful. Great. I appreciate that. Well, with that, um, I will, I, you know, I'll just be over here quiet, um, not literally exiting stage left, um, but that'll give the, the rest of the audience an opportunity to ask you all questions. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Carolyn. Rachel and Christiane, thank you so much, so much for your con conversation you. today. Thank you for a yeah, great conversation. You. Yeah, amazing. Thank you, Charlotte and Christiane, Rachel, and an American who had to um, hop off. So we got a lot of questions um, today. We'll just take a few for, for time's sake. Um, the first one is from uh, Saisha. I'm going to, uh, Saisha Grayson, see if you can unmute there. I'm not. Yeah, there we go. Hi. Um, I was actually kind of asked to kind of prompt further on the, the comment I made about politics and awareness and empathy. And I thought that was a really interesting part of the discussion, sort of what, what is the difference between pointing to and helping people just know something? Because, you know, especially I think about this a lot in the documentary film space, like there's so much documentary film produced about things you should be aware of. 
and how far awareness gets us and how far empathy gets us versus what I see, not verse, we don't want to set it up quite that way, but what I see so much in the work of these artists and Christine, thank you for pulling together such an incredible show is um, the framework for the structural conversations um, so that, that you can go out into the world and sort of build a framework to ask the kind of questions about like, well, what would I do with this awareness? Or what, what is being left out of the frame when this film wants me to cry, but it doesn't tell me what to do with that. You know, So I think that there's something really interesting about these artists and, and the way that the work is not just pointing to a problem, but um, asking for this kind of complex, negotiation between the the structures that you experience as it is and the possibilities of thinking differently. So that's that was kind of my take, but I'm curious from the artists themselves, you know, how you think about the the work of the work, um, not being a sort of flattening politics, but and how you build that into the way you do it, because I think you all do. I can just kick it off. Yeah. Um, I'm not an artist, of course, and yeah. uh, Rachel has more to uh, say about that from the artist's uh, perspective. Once again, I do not want to instrumentalize art um, in any way. And I think we have to um, make major differences between activist art that very often creates frameworks in which to very concretely um, change our behavior or processes or intervene and art that creates more awareness. But for me, the power of art is also the emotional impact it has. Uh, and um, looking at computer design after having seen American artists work, for example, uh, would always lead me to comment on things more, to make other people more aware of these built-in uh, structures, which is important. Uh, and I think it is that emotional impact that also makes us question our behavior in concrete uh, situations and awareness can be enacted in so many different ways. Um, yeah, I think the like backing up and asking yourself like what you're going to art for is like a good like a good place for me um uh when engaged in this uh in this conversation i think that because i the the what you're asking is about it's like the yeah like the relationship between how to learn a lesson is that from what i understand i'll just like sort of restate it's like how to learn a lesson or sort of how to change someone's mind right it's like that's the like the, the engaging in 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 art to sort of learn something um or um but like right is that sort of like what the like sort of area that you're asking about i'm sorry i wasn't able to unmute myself um i in some way i mean i think in some way I was responding to the conversation that was happening then, which is sort of like the limits of awareness, which mm -hmm. is not to say that that's not a, a, a powerful goal, but that when, when art's justification in larger society kind of gets left at that, like, oh, we point to things and then we make people aware of them and that changes things, um, that that can be very flattening as much as a, as a conversation about sort of instrumentalizing it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just that, I, what I see in a lot of the work that that the artists in the show you do is a combination of what it means to learn something, what it means to feel something, what it means to understand a structure that you could um, that complicates the way you see, and so it becomes this multi-layered experience that um, that you take with you. Um, mm -hmm that isn't just about sort of that that film made me cry or I feel bad for those people or oh god that's horrible I shouldn't have bought this phone and then you but you still buy the phone because you have to because you're inside of these structures and so you can sort of continue to live with the complexity of it um, in a way that's different than I think a, a more um, just pointing to awareness as the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for that, that question. Um, and let's see, our next one, uh, Eleanor is going to ask on behalf of an audience member. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel and Christian and Charlotte and American artist. 
for this amazing conversation. Um, it's been so cool, so awesome. Um, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of Barbara Latanzi. Um, Barbara wrote, I have not seen the exhibition, but thank you for this discussion. What would a contemporary initiation ritual based on ideas of traditional society coming of age rituals look like? What kind of transgression rituals are available for young people trying to make the transition into adulthood with today's technology? What? That's a, that's a big question. <laughs> and thanks for asking, uh, Barbara. Yeah, and I think we could spend a whole hour um, talking about that. Once again, I would say um, what is really important also for younger people in that context is to understand the uh, mechanism of the structures they're um, caught in and how they operate within an, a framework and um, trying to transgress that through interventions or changing the um, tone of um, conversations. I mean, that's a very general uh, comment, but I think particularly in the context of social media and many technologies, flipping the script um, and flipping the corporate script and uh, looking at where it might um, fail or where it does fail effectively, you know, and creatively um, using those niches to, yeah, construct something new at best. Uh, I know that's a lot to ask too, you know, but. I think if, I hope Barbara makes art and that she's working on this because I think that's a great question to. Barbara is actually in the Whitney's collection oh, and okay. also was in the program exhibition at the Whitney. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so she's already working on it, I hope. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's a great, uh, a great question. I don't, I mean, off the, off the cuff, I don't, I would love to workshop that like in like a smaller, you know, like it looked like offstage, I think it'd be really fun, you know, but at the moment, no, I mean, I'm just thinking like, for my own because it's like a, there's like a like yeah ritual around rituals is where I'm getting stuck right it's like and I'm thinking about like what that what that usually means um like I don't know I would say literacy and like programming like actually um working in like understanding what they are of course I'm gonna say that you know but um and, and I and because I find that so valuable today um as I move through the world you know so I'm glad that I did that when I was young Okay, thank, thank you. So yeah, thank you, Barbara, for your question. Um, our next one is from Tansy Shao, who I'm going to ask on their behalf. Um, the art slash artists that we get to see reflect the funding structure of a region more than the sign of the times, which is often a reflection of what the authorities want us to think in order to distract people from real issues. What do you think about this? Is it a unique issue in the States? Uh, I have to um, clarify that also because there is a certain kind of um, generalization implied. Um, and I, I think I get what you're um, going for. And that is kind of the market or art world overall. Um, I do not think that what you're describing is necessarily uh, representative of um, art per se. Um, in terms of the distinction, I think um, the US art world market is certainly a more hyper-capitalized one in general. And um, there you see, I think a little bit more of what you're um, describing. So I would tie the issue directly um, to uh, capital on that level. Um, the philanth uh, philanthropy and philanthropic situation is also different. You have in Europe or in other parts of the world, you have more, um, government funded um, expressions, it just changes um, the tone and what is being um, shown and who is being represented. Uh, so there, there definitely is a difference, I would say. And then I also find it very interesting um, to um, look at 
let's say, Southeast Asian cultures where art is not even primarily understood as visual, but more community based, you know, so it's a super complex um, discussion. Amazing. Thank you, Christian, for, for your answer. Um, and we had one uh, final question. Again, thank you all so much for your questions today. Um, this one is from Sean um, Capone. He writes, does anyone have a reaction to some of the ideas presented by Hito Styrel in her recent essay, Mean Images? Um, not sure if either of you want to comment on that. Yeah, I think what Hito is getting at um, in mean images and mean um, in this um, text and in her research is really using, it's this double entendre on the one hand, mean as the medium. Yeah, and um, then also that medium can of course be mean and in the, in the sense of uh, nasty. Um, I think this perfectly ties back once again to I'm here to learn and what Zach and Jemima are talking about in that piece. And that is um, this kind of pattern uh, recognition and patterning and apophenia, you know, seeing uh, connections between unconnected um, things that Hito Style has also very much uh, written about. Yeah. And so, it's hugely problematic uh, to base um, softwares on these systems um, per se, and mostly stochastic methods, a lot of work to be done um, in that. And I think the idea of mean then also nicely ties in with the type of online behavior we're um, discussing and the trolling. Um, Hito Style uses this example of an image of herself and <laughs> representation of her as, um, um, her specific ethnicity and how it gets represented um, in those images is particularly nasty. So it really nicely exemplifies what we've been talking about. And it goes back to um, what we were saying where we're sort of expecting AI or even like, you know, a lot of what we're what the synecdoche of like technology often points to, right, is like this, is that relationship. And it is saying that we're expecting something impartial and it just absolutely is not. So it's important. Thank you both so much for those answers. Thank you, Sean, and all of you for your questions. Um, so here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm so thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Zoe Darcy here to the stage. Zoe Darcy was born about noon on a Tuesday. Later, they co-founded Tabloid, Tabloid Press, a publishing practice rooted in the poetics of sound, in the poetics and sounds of the local. This work continues. Their chapbook Bell Logic is out from Spiral Editions and forthcoming is a pamphlet on children as kindling from creative writing department titled Unzoomed Kind. They are a candidate for the MFA at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you so much for being here. Zoe, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, cool. Uh, I'll read a little bit from the chat book. I'll just read a couple, but this is a book I guess I was thinking a lot about uh, fascism and the symbol of the bell. Um, but I find this conversation today really interesting and also thinking about patterning because I think sometimes it's like I'm almost trying to write like AI or something. Like I'm sort of trying to create these patterns within my writing. So maybe you'll hear that there's a lot of repetition that happens. This is called Rage, Ideology. I blow bubbles in the water. They think I'm a fool. I believe in my belief in which I believe myself without opposites, a series of one, one, one. I trouble the monument with my tongue, organ too short to march, too long to make meaning. In my belief, the world disappears by eating its anus. Nothing to fear, compare collapsing. 
A tongue takes meaning out of starched by eating. One, one, one. Might tongue dissolve monument? A fool they have told me is a facade, and I have told them my body is a mosaic on a house owned by another. What else but tongue do I have? A wife of myself? With feeling. Let me pull myself together. The important recurrent question is where the light hits. That is, I watch where it shits. I ask for this with complete abandon. I want proof. I want provenance. Show me where the light is shitting. I'm sorry. I want the geodesic distances, diuretic suns. Oh, I want childhood. You're telling me I can't have that. Listen, I was childhood. And I traveled so much I can weave longitudes into major works of art. I get famous. I got famous. Suddenly everyone is talking about longitudes. This gets famous because no one understands distance. I don't know the difference anymore. In this way I start bleeding like a dove on stage and it is familiar. Not the image which will never be famous but the math of this performance and its practical hysterics, its lovable and predictable gymnastics, the method of it. I don't know the difference. I dove like a bleak instrument and all memories become pinkies in the muffled hum of void. That is, I get stuck in the little holes of the audience and I can't say a thing. They're just so passionate, they speak. The effort of my wings flapping makes a sound as loud as an imagined rain and symptomatic of fists on violins and doves on wheels and you are beating the instrument the way you think you ought to have but didn't. Am I crazy for being yoga pilled when I'm a conductor of transcendent victimhood or anger? Or am I crazy for making myself into a flute that journals of its own disaster? Imagine the porn that would come of my private orchestra. All I know is the distance between a DJ and a live set. Just imagine how deep inside you it would reach in heat, the steam, of a thousand hands making sentences which waterfall into crevices and we hear in ourselves a longing so long we tune out the sound of war behind and in front of us. Is that the purpose of literature? No, that's violins. Now doves hum the radio and AI writes TV, but I'm insensitive for calling a cat sexy. It's like I'm taking or making speed, but in an envelope of sound. Now, where's the spotlight? Now, where's mine? Now, tell me where you want it. Now, buy my subscription and listen. An etude. In a demonstration of erotics, the head of each contestant is removed and sharpened to a point. Contestants' clothing is also evaluated for consistency and potential evolution of their image. In part, this demonstration studies each contestant's capacity for integration with future trends. During negotiations, prior to assuring quality and flow of oxygen, Exits are barred and duct taped. In the extant narrative of the monumental, in which a viewer is reminded of authority, the commercial functions as a memorial, a turn or key to survival. On TV, contestants point to concrete positions in which they will turn in sync. If all contestants spin at the same time, isn't that stillness? When toy comes to a stop, all toys stop. Is that still stillness? Okay, I'll do one more. <laughs> Actually, 
This one's for Elise, who is here, Elise Husek. What's in that room? While you were sleeping, I laugh with the song of the dog's labor. While you were losing the dream, I unload the bastard. While you, I plunge the syringe. While the dogs give birth. While pups attached to your nude, I am one arm into a dog sleeve. While the new ones yodel, I am all fours of the exhibit. While they quintuplet, one flap arms about like a hung meat. While douche drips like I flesh advertisement. While tool I breathes and begs. While the question? While human, howsoever, I bark. While dog, howsoever, I need. While need threatens swift, I am losing language. While I can't, I it. While mouth dead in the room, I fur. While the walls fur, mold furs. While the will to watch is rage triangulated. While the room's conventional laughter forms a stage. While on it, you gestate cancer for a dog on fire while I lop the perimeter of this vicarious disease. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Incredible. Thank well, you. Uh, yeah. Thanks yeah. so much. Amazing. Mm. Thank Incredible. you. It's so great. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, American artists, Rachel Rawson, Christian Paul, Charlotte Kent for today. Um, thank you to the Whitney for their support in preparing for today's event. We would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NSC. Please check the chat for a link to donate to support the Rail. Join us Monday at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Chikaya Booker, Phil Sanders, David Nolan, Leanne Norman, and Tom McGlynn on the occasion of Chikaya Booker Public Opinion at David Nolan Gallery. And we will conclude with a poetry reading by Tayonga Leslie. And you can now all turn your microphone on and say hello and goodbye as you leave and get into the weekend. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank everyone. you, everyone. Oh, Thank so much. Great Thank poems. You. Bye. Thank you, Christiane. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Rachel. Bye. Thanks, American Bye. artists. Thank, Thank you for the reading, Zoe. Thank, Thank you. Great reading. Um, thanks to American artists. Thank you. Care. Bye. Bye.